My name is Paul Bratch, and I'm the Director of Discipleship here at OUMC. We want to welcome you to Onalaska United Methodist Church this morning. We're glad you're here with us on this beautiful Labor Day weekend. Um, we have just a few announcements before we begin today's service. First of all, um, we've all, of course, been hearing so much about uh, Hurricane Harvey and all of the damage that's been caused down in Texas. Uh, as a church, we wanted to be a part of the, that response to the disaster and to help out in uh, ways that we can. And so one of the things we're doing is that you'll find an envelope or some envelopes in your pews there. And if you're interested in making a donation to UMCOR, which is the United Methodist Committee on Relief, they are down there in Texas, uh, boots on the ground, and they are helping out the victims and helping with the recovery efforts. And so uh, if you put a cash or a check in this and just drop it in the offering plate, we'll collect those all and then um, send them to UMCOR. And the really nice thing about UMCOR is that since United Methodists pay to cover all the administrative and overhead costs, 100% of your donation will go directly to the people that are being affected by the storm. So uh, that again, that can just go into the offering baskets or you could drop it off in the office uh, at a later time. We have uh, all sorts of fall groups that are starting up again after taking the summer off here. So this coming Saturday, there will be uh, the men's breakfast at 8 o'clock. And uh, choir is starting up again this coming Thursday. No. Someone told me that it was. It's not. Uh, a, a week from Thursday. Let's make that a week from Thursday now. Uh, and, uh, uh, and let's see, this next Sunday is Rally Day, uh, September 10th. So Rally Day means that our Sunday school classes for our children and our youth and our adults will be starting that day, um, possibly with the exception of one of the adult groups, but we'll get information out about that. Uh, and so that will all be starting up on Sunday. And then uh, this coming Sunday, we will also be revealing our new small groups and our one and dones uh, for the fall semester here. So lots of big things starting up. Uh, SOAR and SOAR Junior and Confirmation will also be starting up on the 13th. So there are all kinds of things uh, in the works here. All right, I believe that is it for the announcements. Let's go ahead and stand and begin our worship by greeting each other with the peace of Christ. Good morning. Let's join us with a call to worship as uh, on the screen or printed in the bulletin. Sing praises oh God, to God, all you saints, and give thanks to God's holy name. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes with the morning. You turn our mourning into dancing. Let us join in our opening hymn, O oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing.
may be seated. The scripture reading this morning comes from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law with it within them, and I shall write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Thus ends in the reading. Uh, will children come up for children's time? to see you guys today out for the holiday. So does anyone know what tomorrow is? Labor. Labor Day. And what does Labor Day mean? Anybody know? Yep, that's a day that people usually don't have to work and um, we celebrate all the, all the work that people do for us, right? And so today we're going to be learning about work and how God cares about our jobs. So I have some jobs on note cards here. And I have some questions about those jobs. So what's the first one? Garbage. garbage collector. So what does a garbage collector do? Garbage. Picks up garbage. Yeah, how do, so they help others by picking up garbage, right? So what would happen if no one did this job? Well, yeah, there'd be, it would smell. It would be garbage left all over the place. All right, how about this? Animal doctor. How does, that, how does an animal doctor help others? Help people care for their pets and farm animals, yep. And what would happen if no one did that job? Yeah, some of the animals might die and no one would care for them. All right, how about this one? Police, Police person. How do they help others? They help solve crimes. Help solve crimes. And they help people, they might help people find their lost pets or they might help people that are lost get home, right? What if no one did that job? What if there were no police? Might be a lot of crimes or, yep. Everything might get stolen. Yep, that would not be good. How about this job? A house builder. So what do they do? They build houses. Boy, they're smart, aren't they? <laughs> this is too easy for you. What if no one did that job? Yeah, we wouldn't live in houses, right? That would not be good. Okay, finally, how about this job? Mother. mother. What does a mother do? Yeah, you better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Takes care of their kids. What if we didn't have any mothers? This could be really funny. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be people, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> So God gives people many different kinds of work, don't they? And all these jobs are so important. We're going to see what the Bible says about work, all right, from Genesis 2, 19 and 20. I can find it here. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land and all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper, perfect for him, was nowhere to be found. So humans had a job right away, right? They had to do all the naming. That might be hard. Yeah. 
Yeah, so God wants us to do our best work in whatever we do, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about what you guys can do for, how can you work? I know you're just kids, but what can you do for work? How can you help people? You can do a lemonade stand, help people who are thirsty that are out for a walk, or you could donate your money. You got, any of you guys help your mom and dad around the house a little bit here or there? Yeah. Yeah, to help clean up and get ready for the day. Okay, so I want you guys to celebrate all the work you do too tomorrow, okay? All right, let's pray. Dear God, help us to try to have a good attitude about work and forgive us when our attitude is bad. Teach us to work each day as we are always working for you. Be with us each day. Amen. All right, if you guys want to go to Children's Church, you can follow me. Uh, please join me this morning in our prayer of confession, which is in your bulletin and up on the screen. Almighty and merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. And what Treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Well, uh, one of my favorite TV shows of all time is the show Seinfeld. I'm sure in a crowd this size, we must have some other Seinfeld fans, right? Yeah, yeah. So Seinfeld is famously a show about nothing, which sounds really interesting, right? <laughs> there aren't uh, great plot lines running through all the episodes or that sort of thing, but it's really the characters that make this show work uh, and the characters that are just so funny. Uh, one of my favorite characters in this show is Frank Costanza. He's the father of George, one of the main characters. And Frank is very short-tempered, and he comes up with these crazy ideas. One of my favorites is a holiday that he invented because he got tired of the stress and the commercialism of Christmas. And he called his holiday Festivus, a, a Festivus for the rest of us, he says. And uh, the idea came to him while he was in a department store, he was uh, trying to get a doll for his child and got in a fight with another man and was thinking, there's got to be a better way than this. He says, as I was, <laughs> in fact, he says, as I was raining blows down upon this man, I realized there must be a better way. And so a new holiday was born, a Festivus for the rest of us. Now, Festivus uh, uses some of the imagery and some of the tradition from Christmas but it changes them in order to make a point and to, to uh, celebrate in a way that Frank sees as best. So he expands on the idea of Christmas in his own strange way. And so instead of a Christmas tree, uh, this is what they use, an aluminum pole. They put up an, an aluminum pole in their living room. There's still a big family meal. And during the family meal, they uh, participate together in the airing of grievances, which means that you... 
you tell all your family members all the ways that they've disappointed you over the last year. <laughs> and then this, of course, is followed by the feats of strength. And <laughs> Festivus is not over until his son George can pin him to the ground. <laughs> So this is Festivus, a Festivus for the rest of us. Uh, Frank takes this experience that means one thing, but he adapts it and gives it new meaning and new significance. Now, why on earth am I explaining this strange made-up holiday to you all here in church? Uh, I want to talk about how this relates to our Christian holiday called Pentecost. And yes, I also realize that Pentecost is nowhere near September or Labor Day. Typically happens in May, I believe. Uh, about 50 days after Easter, but uh, we are beginning a new sermon series. And last year, we took the entire school year and we preached through something called the story, where we went through the Bible from beginning to end, and we looked at the, the large overarching story of the Bible and all of the major themes, uh, kind of like the, the 30,000 foot view of the Bible. Over these next few weeks, kind of like Paul Harvey, we're going to be looking at the rest of the story. Uh, which doesn't mean that we're going to go through all of the stories in the Bible in great detail. Uh, what it does mean is that we are going to take a handful of stories from the Bible and we're going to take an up-close and personal look at those stories and really dig in deep. Um, we're especially going to uh, focus on how when you really look at the, the history, the culture, the context of some of these stories, it can really make the stories come alive for you and it helps you to, to see yourself in those stories. Uh, so uh, it, it, it can be helpful to look at, at those major sections of the Bible, those large themes. It can also be really helpful just to look closely at very specific stories. And the story of Pentecost is a great example of this, which is why we're talking about it in September. In fact, so far we've talked about Christmas and Pentecost, huh? All right, well, anyway, uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 2, so if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, that's where we'll be. If you've been around the church for a while, you're probably familiar with Pentecost. It's the day that God filled his followers with the Holy Spirit. It's kind of the birthday of the church, and it comes 50 days after Easter. It may surprise you, though, to know that Pentecost is not originally a Christian holiday. Uh, for centuries before uh, the Pentecost that we celebrate, the Jewish people had been celebrating Pentecost. Uh, when we learn a little bit more about this feast and the things that were involved in the Jewish celebration of Pentecost, it can really uh, add enormously to our understanding of what's going on in this story in Acts chapter 2. So here's how uh, the writer of Acts describes this scene. When the day of Pentecost came, Jesus' followers were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter stood up with the eleven other disciples, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. And then, uh, and then Peter goes on to basically give a sermon talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then it says later in the chapter that those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day. Now, Peter and the other disciples of Jesus were in the old city of Jerusalem here. And the old city of Jerusalem is very compact, as you can see in this picture. It's really hard to imagine 3,000 people gathering outside of any of these houses inside the walls of this cramped city with its narrow and winding streets. But what if the house that this writer is speaking of is not the upper room of a house, as many people imagine, but actually the temple itself that the Bible often calls the house of God? Now, here's why a lot of people think that that may be the case. Pentecost, which was called Shavuot uh, in Hebrew, means the Feast of Weeks, is one of the three major festivals that required Jews to travel to the temple. So no matter where you lived, you were supposed to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and the temple to celebrate this festival. Uh, at nine in the morning, which is, what it says, uh, uh, which is when it says that this happened in verse 15, Jesus' followers would have been at the temple. 
along with all the other Jewish pilgrims from all of these different countries uh, who had come to celebrate that feast. So it's actually likely that the sound of this violent wind and this vision of tongues of fire described in this passage didn't take place in a small upper room somewhere, but in front of thousands of people within the temple courts. And it was here that, that Peter would have had the opportunity to preach to thousands of people. It says that 3,000 people um, were not only added to their number that day, but also baptized. And there's no house that would have enough baths to dunk 3,000 people in, uh, in the, a morning. So, uh, but what's interesting is that right outside the temple, there were 100 ceremonial pools that were used for purifying worshipers before they entered the temple. They were, used for, they were also used for immersing new converts to Judaism. And so it's very likely it would make a lot of sense that this is where the 3,000 Jewish believers would have been baptized. Now, isn't this interesting? I love this kind of stuff. Uh, it just helps to, to add to the story so much. Uh, our understanding of the culture and the history and that time can, can uh, really help these stories to come alive. But this doesn't stop here. Uh, you see, God was using... Uh, all sorts of traditions from Pentecost to send a message to his people. So let's talk a little bit about what God was saying. At least 2,000 years, or I'm, I'm sorry, at least 200 years before Jesus was born, uh, rabbis were noting that the Israelites reached Mount Sinai 50 days after they left Egypt. And so this led them to think that if Passover commemorated the Exodus, or God rescuing the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt, then Pentecost must have to do with the giving of the law uh, to Moses. Now at the festival of Pentecost, the priests would have read a particular passage from the Bible. And this passage was Exodus 19 and 20, in which God comes down to Mount Sinai and he gives the Ten Commandments uh, to seal the relationship that he was making with his people, to seal that covenant. And during Moses' encounter with God, it says that the whole mountain seemed like it was consumed by fire. So just as God's presence was marked with fire at Mount Sinai, God was making his presence known at Pentecost with these tongues of fire that came to rest on his people. <coughs> Excuse me. But at the time, uh, but this time there was a crucial difference because instead of carving God's law in stone like he had at Mount Sinai, now he was placing it within people through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so instead of the law being carved into stone and, and fire descending on a mountain, the law is being carved into people's hearts and fire is descending above the, these individual people. So the first time that God's fire descended, God gave his law to instruct people and convict us of sin. The second time, God gave his spirit to actually change us from within. It says here in Jeremiah chapter 31, as Ruth read earlier, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is what we see happening on the day of Pentecost. God is giving his spirit to us to actually change us from within, which is something that a law carved onto stone tablets could never do. Now there's one more thing that I find really interesting about this passage uh, before we wrap up here. This is just too interesting not to include. See, on the, the morning of Pentecost, there's actually another passage that the priests would have read. And it's a, excuse me, a pretty remarkable passage from the book of Ezekiel. Now the first two chapters of Ezekiel, they talk about uh, Ezekiel the prophet having this vision of a windstorm with lightning and fire and Ezekiel's terrified, and he falls face down on the ground until God commands him to stand up. And then Ezekiel is filled with God's Holy Spirit. And God then commissions Ezekiel to be his prophet, empowering him to take his divine message to the people. So the people would have just heard this passage read aloud about a windstorm and lightning and fire and then people being commissioned to take God's divine message to the people. Do you see the similarity to the Pentecost story here? The Holy Spirit came to Jesus' followers with wind and fire and commissioned them to speak God's new divine message, not only to their people, but to people of all nations, 
who were represented by the people from all the nations who were gathered there for this festival. See, Pentecost was a festival for the Jewish people, but like Frank Costanza, if I can compare God to Frank Costanza, <laughs> forgive me, God uses the, the traditions of Pentecost in order to make a point, but he also expands on it. He changes it, and he gives it new meaning and new significance. And it's even greater than what God just did among these 12 disciples or among those 3,000 converts on one particular morning. God also invites us to come and be a part of this whole new way to live. Uh, he invites us to be a part of this life in the Spirit. And God's followers are filled by the Holy Spirit and commissioned by God now to take his message, his divine message, his good news of life and love and peace and forgiveness to anyone and everyone. And so it doesn't rhyme as well as Festivus, but God created a Pentecost for the rest of us. I hope you can see that, that when you really dig deep within a particular story in the Bible, and especially when you can look at the context and the history and the culture behind what was going on, uh, it, it helps, helps us to be able to find out what it would be like to be a part of that story. It helps us to, to find out more of what was happening there, see some of those nuanced details that help the story to come alive for us. And it's actually easier for us to find our place in, in a particular story and then in the larger story of the Bible as well. And so I find this kind of thing so interesting, and I, I hope that you do too. We are really looking forward to spending the next few weeks taking an up-close look at some more stories within the Bible, and we hope that it will spark a desire in all of us uh, to, to want, really want to see the Bible come alive uh, so that we can understand God's good news and live it out among everyone that we meet. Amen. into our prayer time today. We have a chance to share our joys and our concerns with the Lord and with each other. So what specific prayer requests do we have this morning? Yes, people that serve us on a daily basis, military, law enforcement, prayers for Holden as he's continuing to recover from a motorcycle accident. Uh, we can certainly add uh, Pastor Park and his family as they're traveling all over the country. They made it down to Texas and then New Orleans to visit a couple of colleges for Eric. <laughs> Wasn't the greatest timing to be going to those particular places, but it turned out okay for them. And now I believe they're in Indiana visiting some family before they come home tomorrow. So. Father God, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy and hear our prayer. Father, this morning we bring before you uh, prayers for the people who were affected by Hurricane Harvey. We ask that uh, that you would bring them exactly what they need, that if there are people that still need rescuing, that they would come soon, that uh, if there are people that uh, are, are recovering from, from injuries or health issues, that you would speed their healing, that uh, for people that need food and water and shelter, that you would provide for them. Father, would you um, show us 
how we can help, how we can contribute, things that we can do to really make a tangible difference in the lives of the people that were affected by this storm. We thank you for those who are um, putting so much effort into raising money and, and to doing what they can to help out, especially uh, people like J.J. Watts, who has raised $17 million so far to help with the recovery. Uh, we just pray that, that uh, the outpouring of, of love and help would continue for the people affected by that storm. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for Larry and his 75th birthday. We pray that it would be a wonderful day, uh, that you would continue to um, give him a, a great year. We thank you for his presence uh, here in our community and uh, for all the ways that he touches our lives. We thank you also that his family is able to be here to celebrate with him. Uh, for our military and uh, law enforcement and those who serve us on a daily basis, God, we pray that you would protect them, that you would keep them safe, uh, that you would bring peace. For our teachers and students who are going back to school, we ask that uh, you, would, you would help the, the start of the school year to go well, that everyone would get settled in, and, and uh, we pray that this would be a wonderful year of, of learning and fun for the students. And uh, if there are ways that we can be supporting the, the schools in our community, would you show us what, what we can be doing to help make a difference there? For Holden, who is recovering from, from the motorcycle accident, we thank you that he's making progress and ask that you would continue to speed up his healing. And for the Hunter family who are traveling, we thank you that they've had safe travels so far. I pray that that, that would continue and that uh, Pastor Park and uh, Pastor Annalisa would all come back refreshed. Father, for all of, these, all, the, all of these requests, we ask that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Would you come and bring good out of difficult situations? Would you bring the peace, the healing, the joy, and the hope that we so desperately need? And we ask now that you would bless us, empower us, and send us out to share your love with everyone that we meet. And we join together now to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Would the ushers please come forward for the collection? All right, well, now we want to join together in celebrating communion this morning. And uh, I would like to ask the communion helpers to come up uh, right now and go ahead and, and start getting ready. Uh, everyone is welcome to participate in communion uh, here at OUMC. This is not our table, this is God's table. And uh, anyone who wants to have an experience with God this morning is welcome to participate. So we serve communion in two ways. On your left over here, uh, we will be serving by intinction, which is a fancy word that means that uh, when you come forward, put out your hands, you'll receive a piece of bread. You can dip that in the, the cup of juice and then eat both together. On your right, you will receive a piece of bread and then an individual cup of juice. There is also gluten-free bread on that particular side, so feel free to choose whichever side you prefer. 
Uh, if you're unable to come to the front, when the lines start dying down up here, um, just raise your hand and some of our communion servers will come back to serve you. Uh, and uh, for everyone over on, uh, on this side over here, we will have a Stephen minister available to anoint you and pray for you also. So on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread, thanked God for it, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said that this bread is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And when dinner was over, in the same way he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink this, all of you. This wine is my blood of the new covenant and is poured out for you for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father God, as we remember these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us your body and the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final glory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, amen. All right, so we will serve our, our communion helpers and our musicians first and then uh, the ushers will welcome you up to the table. hope that your time here has been meaningful. If you would like someone to pray with, someone to talk with this upcoming week, um, feel free to contact Pastor Park, myself, 
one of our Stephen ministers, or you can always just uh, give a call to the office. Also, uh, any of us would be happy to spend some time with you. Um, just one quick note also, uh, if anyone is interested in coming back uh, around noon with a big truck to help move a couch that will go down in the youth room, please let me know after the service because we are still looking for someone. All right. Uh, so uh, let's close this morning with a final song and then a blessing. Now, as we go out this morning, may the Lord bless and keep you. May his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.